them to stop them. Now, what are we trying to answer as a scientific question? Well, we're trying to understand the, the most elementary building blocks of matter. Uh, so we are essentially zooming into material much smaller, much further in scale than the quarks. In a way, what we are doing is pretty much uh, like a time machine. We are trying to complement the, the work done by our colleagues from astronomy and astrophysics by reproducing the, the mat matter as it was in the very, very early uh, stage of the, of the universe. When you have telescopes, uh, what you are relying on to get data is the, the, the observation of the light that reaches the telescope from all corners of the universe. But if you go back in time, the, there was a substantial amount of time during which light could not escape. Our universe was so dense that it could not escape. So the idea is that by colliding protons at very high energy, you reproduce matter as it was right after the Big Bang. And that is something that has uh, been around for quite some time. You know, the model of the Big Bang was based on, on two pillars, the, uh, the general theory of relativity by Einstein and the cosmological principle. And the way to unite these two, these two pillars was to have a singularity, the Big Bang. And this is when the expansion of the universe started. And in this model, uh, you need to go or, uh, beyond certain level of, of energy to simulate, to emulate rather, the, the, the matter as it was uh, at the beginning of the universe. If you want to go further back in time, you will need to have even more energy at the center of mass, even more energy involved in the collisions. So if you look at the, the, well, the story of our universe today, by looking at light observation of our universe, you have very robust models of uh, what our, our universe is made of. With the LHC, we go back in time. And the, the closest you get to the Big Bang and the more challenging it is to, um, to, to, to reproduce matter as it was. So the LHC is as still, uh, we hope, a lot of discovery potential, but it is already clear that we will need, if we want to go further back in time, if we want to understand or push the boundaries of our knowledge in particle physics, we will need a next accelerator that will unlock even more um, uh, phenomena that we can study. At CERN, we've been blessed with uh, the, uh, the presence on our premises of various uh, Nobel Prize winners in physics. The two last ones were these gentlemen. Uh, they were awarded the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the Higgs boson. Uh, in order to reach the point where you can have a discovery, you need innovation. You need to develop technologies in four areas, the accelerators, the detectors, and the computing uh, capabilities. When you look at, a, at the accelerator, if you look inside one of these blue objects, which are essentially dipole magnets, it is quite a, a masterpiece of engineering. These magnets are ensuring that the particles remain in orbit around the 27 kilometers of the accelerator. If you look in there, you will find two beams. So one beam is going clockwise, the other counterclockwise. And this part here is the superconductive coil that is producing the magnetic field required to bend the trajectory of these particles. So inside that object, you will find innovation in the field of superconductive material. In the field of vacuum, the vacuum inside the beam pipe is about the same as what you would find between the Earth and the Moon, so it's super high vacuum. And cryogenics, because for this material to be superconductive, it needs to be at 1.8 Kelvin. So inside the, 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 the volume, the vacuum vessel of this magnet, you will find 
liquid, well, superfluid helium. So this object in itself illustrates how much technology and engineering has been involved in the, the production of the first prototype of this magnet. Of course, since there are more than 3,000 of these magnets, CERN has not built it, and it, we, we don't have the capabilities to do it. But we've, we built the first prototype in collaboration with industry, and once the prototype was deemed to be robust enough, fit for purpose, then industry took over and produced the, um, the, the great number of copies that we have now installed. So this accelerator are bringing the beams to collide in four locations in CMS. So if CMS is the detector that is, um, let's say, to which the University of Benin is now a member. And you've got three other ones uh, that are distributed around the 27 kilometers of the accelerator. When you look at the data coming out of a detector after the collision, you can represent these data sets in a graphic manner. And this is what you see on your screen. This is the collision point. And the, the lines that you see here are plots of the trajectory of the biparticles, or the charged biparticles. And these kind of boxes that you see there is a representation of the amount of energy of the particle that were, um, that were um, intercepted by the detector or that that were break in, in, breaking into the detector, emitting light. Now, these 3D representations are, are there to show how complex it is to understand what happens after, after one collision. And we produce a billion such collisions per second, and we run 24-7. So the amount of data flowing out of the detectors is gigantic. These detectors, to use an analogy, are kind of 3D cameras, just extremely, extremely fast. They measure the energy, the direction, and uh, the charge of particles that are uh, given rise after the collisions. There is no way uh, we can store 1 billion collisions per second. And, and really, even if we could, we would never have as a worldwide community in high energy physics, we would never have the manpower to analyze all these collisions. So very early on in the data acquisition chain, we need to go from 1 billion collisions per second to just 40 million pictures a second, right? So this is like a filtering process. Uh, this involves sometimes working with FPGAs, sometimes further down the data acquisition chain, working with high performance computing. The end result is that we want to only store 1000 such pictures per second. And once these data sets are stored, then the data is safe. Everything happening before that, your data is lost forever. One thing that is quite unique, I think, and, and interesting is that these detectors are not built by CERN, they're not built by industry, they are built by academics like you guys. Generation of students, postdocs, and faculty worked on the design and construction of these detectors. And that's a beautiful illustration of uh, the collab collaborative power of academics. This is a, a picture of the CMS detector. Um, and just to give you an idea of the scale of what the detector looks like, these are steel frames taken during maintenance operation on the CMS detector. Here you see the cavern floor, and this is the size of the detector. So you can see that this is very big. This is 15 meters in height, 15 meters across, and okay, this you can't see, but it is a 25 meters long. This object that you see here, this is the beam pipe. So this is through that beam pipe that the two beams are brought to the collision point. The objects that are moving are essentially slices of the detector. The detector consists of 13 slices and they can be opened or closed depending if we are in operation, in which case they have to be all closed or like here, we can open them 
to access the inner parts of the detectors of the detector in case there has been some uh, you know, damage to a component. It can be damage to a pipe, damage to a sensor, damage to a, um, a fiber optic connection, whatever. You know, this is a very a aggressive environment. When we are running, the, the level of radiation is very high. The magnetic field is very high. And we are working with a combination of services that don't normally, um, let's say, uh, do well together, like high power systems with water cooling and so on. Once your data is stored, and this is happening at CERN, we have a tier zero, we call it at CERN, the data analysis will take place, place throughout the world. The idea is to decentralize the computing or the, the processing of the data. Altogether, CERN has a million processing cores spread around 170 data centers across 42 countries. In a couple of months, we will have a 43rd country uh, with Lebanon, who is, where they are going to open an, an HPC um, for the processing of data. One of the hopes with the collaboration we have built with the University of Benin, that maybe one day we'll be able to have such a high performance computing center built in, in Nigeria also for the purpose of providing capacity uh, for the, the studies in high energy physics, but also for other sciences. Okay, we have some other programs and maybe I'm not gonna spend too much time on that, um, but let's say the LHC is our flagship project, but many other uh, different types of accelerators exist on site. So one might ask, uh, why are you still colliding? Uh, you found the Higgs boson. Well, even with the Higgs boson, it's worth remembering that 95% of the mass and the energy of the universe is still unknown to us. This is a, you know, a question that we have been trying to answer for a long time. You know, what is dark matter? What is dark energy? And even though they are very quite convincing theories, the experimental um, evidence is still lacking. And that's why we keep on colliding and what we will keep on colliding for, I believe, years to come. In fact, um, a lot of these particles are potentially, potential particles candidates are, are so difficult to produce that in order to speed up the discovery process, we have decided to build an upgrade to the current detector, which we, which we call the high luminosity LHC. The energy of the particles of the protons that we collide today has reached its nominal value, the 14 TeVs. We won't be able to go any further without replacing the accelerator, which means a bigger tunnel. So that's, never, that's not gonna happen anytime soon. But one thing we can do is to put more protons in the beams to have even more collisions per second. And this should boost the amount of data that we get so that even if a particle is partic particularly difficult to produce, we will have hopefully enough statistic to still see it with the high luminosity LHC. Now the future uh, could be very exciting. Um, it is clear that the LHC one day will reach the limit of its discovery potential. The next machine is already being, or the next collider is being uh, designed. Uh, we call it the FCC. It would be a 91 kilometer ring. Uh, it would be a huge innovation driver I mean, in, in so many fields. I mean, if only the, um, the tunneling, so the civil engineering challenge, it will be, will be enormous. Um, we would need to dig a 91 kilometer ring in a mountainous region going under a lake with shafts that sometimes have to go as, as deep as 400 meters. Now, the tentative time scale for this project would be to get approval in 2028, hoping to get it started, uh, to start operation in 2045. We've got a very strong support uh, from the US for this, but they also, uh, has a, there's also a, com a competition from China to build uh, something similar. Uh, 
which is, you know, it's good. It's, it keeps uh, the community on its toes. This is what it would like. It would, would look like uh, if it's ever built. So you would have the LHC, which is here, 27 kilometers, and the FCC, as you can see, is much, much larger going under Lake Geneva and going around a mountain range here. Let me talk a bit about collaboration. So CERN was created in the 50s. Um, at, the, at the time, there were only 12 European member states. Today, we have grown. Uh, there are 23 member states, but we have also started to look further than Europe. And typically, we have partners in Pakistan and India, which are associate member states. And we also have corpor international cooperation agreements, uh, which, are, which is a, a kind of formal uh, relationship um, to remove the red tape when collaborating uh, with CERN. And so with UNIBEN and with uh, NA University in Nigeria, the mechanism to work together is through what we call collaborations. Any university in the world, whether they are from member states like Germany, France, or the UK, or non-member states like the US and China, these universities can decide to inject their manpower, their financial resources in the operation, upgrade, maintenance of detectors. Right? And so in the case of UNIBEN, this, uh, these resources are being injected into the CMS detector. At, we, have currently ha we currently have one PhD student from UniBen based at CERN. On a CERN campus, uh, we have 18,000 scientists, but only 2,600 of these are actually employed by CERN. We also, of course, have postdocs, we have undergrad students, we have associate uh, professors, but the vast majority of the people you will meet at CERN are what we call users. And a user is typically anybody with an affiliation to a university that is a member of a CERN experiment. So UniBen, uh, being a member of CMS, anybody with an affiliation to UniBen can be eligible to become a user. And being a user means that you can come to CERN as you, as you please. You can work on projects with CMS and you can use our research facilities. And of course, we have also many uh, companies. So CERN has been a, a model of uh, collaboration. Uh, we, are a, we are typically proceeding by consensus inside collaborations and the kind of governance that we have has been also used for a light source called Sesame, which is based in, in Jordan. So this is an accelerator, but it's not a collider. A light source is a synchrotron. So you, you are essentially accelerating electrons also in a circular accelerator. And these electrons, when their trajectory is being bent, will emit light. And this light can be used to uh, do what we call crystallography, so to look at the structure into matter. Uh, we also do a lot of, uh, we mentioned before, we did a lot of, uh, we are doing a lot of technology and development and innovation. Uh, some of you already may know that CERN is the birthplace of the World Wide Web. Um, not so much because we wanted to develop a, a, a new internet, but because our physicists were getting really annoyed having to carry their data on tapes from one building to the, to the next. And so this is how the, 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 web world world, the web was born, connecting computers to exchange data. And there are many more examples. We're working a lot in medical applications because accelerators are also a way to provide solution to treat cancer. A lot of imaging, we're also working in aerospace. Uh, the fact that we have a, a, a very significant knowledge in superconductive material, we collaborate with Airbus on the development of the next electric jet engine and so on and so forth. We have a dedicated outfit called the Knowledge Transfer Group, uh, which is handling the, the technology coming out of the Sun research and trying to find synergies with other stakeholders 
to bring these technologies to, to society. These are just examples of the sort of medical application that are the result of uh, technologies developed at CERN. So again, accelerators for, the, for radiotherapy and sensors for uh, PET imaging. We also have a stake in quantum computing. Um, CERN at the moment is not going to be working so much on the hardware, but we are using our network uh, of scientists around the world to create a forum where the, these uh, ex exchange can be done between uh, universities and between uh, labs uh, on the latest breakthroughs that uh, they have uh, reached. Such R&D uh, uh, initiatives are also in the field of sensing and communication. And we work with top tier, uni top -tier universities around the world, as well as uh, industry giants in the field of computing. Now, training and education is one of our pillars. Uh, we have the mission given by our member state to train the, the, the younger generation. Uh, so at CERN, we have over 3,000 PhD students, uh, which means that about 600 PhD theses are completed every year. Uh, one program that is uh, very successful is our summer program. So this is a program that enrolls up to 300 undergrad students every year. Each country is uh, invited to, 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 uh, to get one of their students sponsored by CERN. And if more than one is uh, possible, then the funding has to come by, uh, through other means. But at least it's one student per country. The uh, the, the people, of course, all these people coming through CERN cannot necessarily get jobs in the field of high energy physics, which remains a small community. But the good news is that 45% uh, of our alumni uh, had no trouble at all finding uh, jobs, whether it's in industry or other fields. <clears throat> Very recently, uh, we opened an education, a new education center at CERN called the Science Gateway. This was inaugurated in October 7, on October 7th by the, among others, the president of the Swiss Federation. There the idea is to try to provide the facilities for high school students and even younger to get excited about science and hopefully uh, consider an education in science. <clears throat> so what can we do with the universities who decide to become a part of the family? Well, the first thing we try and do is to build capacity. These are two initiatives in Lebanon. The first one to the left is the creation of a state-of-the-art optical lab that has been used ever since to hire postdocs and PhD students to work on the development of optical technologies in Lebanon. And to the right, you see uh, the pictures of the data center of the high performance computing center that CERN helped set up in Lebanon uh, so that the community, the research community could get their hands on a facility with the adequate computing capabilities to support research, PhDs or postdocs. And for that, we needed, of course, a lot of support from uh, philanthropists the diaspora and so on. What can we do uh, on top of that? So the virtual visit, I don't need to explain. You're gonna see that in a few minutes. What we are trying to do very much is to create a pipeline of talents. The idea is to use the summer program, which is only eight weeks. So it's, you know, it's in eight weeks, you can't dream of publishing or to come up with a new technology, but it gives you a taste of what it's like to work in an international lab. So this is a stepping stone. And based on that, then through CMS, you can get internships. So at bachelor level, at master's level, of course, and at PhD level. In addition, sabbaticals are also most welcome. Uh, this allows the, the faculty to learn from the cutting edge research that we do and bring that back to their home university to also transfer technology and even to supervise students from that university. 
These are a few pictures taken this year about uh, the uh, the summer program. This, this particular picture was about the the GCC, uh, so the uh, the Gulf countries. Uh, the uh, as you can see, they, they don't look too bad, too sad. Uh, so it was a a very good year uh, for for the summer program yet again. Uh, it's it is both. A, a scientific experience and a cultural experience. You get to meet people from all over the world and it is very much hands-on. In the morning during this uh, summer program, you get lectures on a variety of topics. It goes from physics to engineering to computing, but also some, some more uh, exotic topics like philosophy or space applications. And the afternoon you have a hands-on uh, placement in a research team to really exercise your skills uh, exper as experimentalists. This is a typical example of a, of a summer program uh, topic. These two students were given the task to push the development of a robot. In, when we are taking data, the environment, as I mentioned, is very aggressive. So no human being can, can be in the cabin next to the detector. However, it's very important for the operation of the detector to be capable of diagnosing potential problem before they become too severe. So having a robot that can go into the cavern and listen, also send images is very useful. The problem is when you've got a super high magnetic field, this is a challenge. And also there is no GPS, we are underground. So these students were given uh, the task to, to build the first prototype of a robot that would be able to operate in magnetic field without Wi-Fi. And uh, they got very far uh, with this, so we were very happy. Uh, this is the test of the robot in the magnetic field in the CMS cavern. And this is what they were doing in the lab prior to deployment in the cavern. So as you can see, it's very, very hands-on. The other thing we can do as a, an alternative uh, to doing an internship at CERN is to do an internship in Sesame. So Sesame, as I said, is not a collider, it's a light source, but it's, it's you know, we feel it's very much like a daughter lab of CERN. CERN injected a lot of, man, lot of energy and manpower to set it up. And there too, uh, it is possible to set up internships uh, for eight weeks really hands-on, as you can see again. You're really here in the accelerator of Sesame. We also try, when possible, to engage with the local industry. This is an example in Bahrain, where you had, we had one student based at CERN designing a new tool for CMS. And back in Bahrain, you had a team of five students building it together with uh, the uh, with the local uh, contractors, nine of them together. And so after the design and manufacturing was done, the tools were sent to CERN for operation. We also like to organize local events when possible. This was an event in Bahrain. Again, uh, it was an awareness day, uh, one for CERN, one for Sesame, so two days all together, where students gave talks, sharing their experience, but also where the network could be strengthened for both uh, CERN and CMS in the country. And finally, I just wanna repeat that we absolutely need philanthropists and foundation to help to the development of relationship with CERN. Any money that goes to uh, the sponsoring of a, um, of a student will go exclusively to the students. There are no fees uh, taken by CERN. That's the end of my talk, uh, just to say that we have a long journey ahead of us, plenty of exciting projects in technology, in physics, in innovation, and I hope we'll have a lot of Nigerian contributions in the future. And I'm available for questions now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Um, we are going to, so does anyone have questions? If you have questions, please, you can go to the um, chat section and drop um, your questions. If you're asking questions um, from schools, because I think currently we have um, 82 um, institutions in Nigeria um, on this 
call right now. So if you're joining as a school, please ask your question and indicate the school you're joining from. If you're asking um, individually, um, please ask your questions too. Uh, we'd love to have your questions. And I think we'll be joining um, the same visits in um, eight minutes, I believe so. Um, so while I wait for um, questions, um, I'm going to, um, I think I need to quickly say that um, we have a different link to join the same um, virtual um, visit itself. This is not a link we'll be using to join that. Um, so the link to join that has been sent to um, your emails. Um, so please, um, you should click on that when it's 11 o'clock. The link is not going to be functional until it's 11 o'clock. So when it's 11 o'clock, um, please um, click on the link and join the um, visit. Also, from whatever school that you're joining from, this has been related uh, via the uh, mail sent out. Um, but from the schools that you're joining from, please take lots of pictures, um, group pictures, um, personal pictures. Uh, send them to us. Um, the best um, of the pictures will be forwarded to Sen. Um, they were requested by Sen. We'll be forwarding the best of the pictures to them, and it will be published on their um, websites and the YouTube page. This um, recording is going to be available too um, on our YouTube page. And the Sen's virtual talk too is going to be available for download, and you can go back to it over and over and over again. Um, so. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Martin. It's a privilege to have you, sir. Um, Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And uh, yeah, don't hesitate if you... Ah, hold on, there are questions popping up. Um, yeah. David, are, are you... Are you... Um, maybe maybe if you can select the questions and, and uh, tell me which one uh you'd like me to answer your <laughs> okay uh, you decide um there's a lot of yeah um, on the no, you want to do it <laughs> um, um, someone said i have a question on the internship what companies i think this person um is not clear about what the internship um is like so okay. the is asking what company um in the sense that um I think the person believes that CMS Atlas are companies. Oh no, no, no. Now, a, a collaboration like CMS is essentially a group of universities sharing their resources for mutual benefits. That's it. It's we are not a we are not for profits. Uh, we don't raise money. Uh, we we are just there to to push the boundaries of human knowledge in physics. But doing so, we need to innovate all the time. So an internship uh, is about sending a student to CERN for a period of time so that the student can learn from us, transfer technology, and hopefully inspire other students to join us. Thank you, sir. Um, there's another question here. Yeah? I think this is a really good one. Um, Simeon Taiwo at King Soya. So Taiwo said, thank you um, for the really insightful session. So, session, sir, my name is Simeon, I have a question. Um, CEN produces a lot of data. Is this data open source so students and interested people can do some personal analysis on them? So good question. Uh, we have some data that is indeed uh, open to, to sharing. Some of the data is only going to our members. The idea is that the data that is available today is data that has been thoroughly analyzed so there's for you know in terms of knowledge there's nothing more we can learn but it's very good practice for our other potential new stakeholders to use it to train their skills in data analysis the data that has the potential for discoveries is really directed first to our members yeah thank you very much sir um, this one is saying that um, what are the chances for someone to start a doctoral research in CERN without directly having an experience working at CERN? Um, is there something we can do to improve our chances of getting a position? So the first step to be able to do a, an internship or a doctorate at CERN is to be part of a university that is a member of a of the CMS collaboration. 
That's step number one. Uh, when this is done, uh, then it's essentially a, a question of um, defining between CMS and the management of that university what topic uh, would be strategically important to, to, to study. Uh, remember that in the case of a PhD student or any other intern, the cost of living of the student have to be supported in a way or another, either by the university, by a company sponsoring, or by a philanthropist. So it is a, essential that the topic of the doctorate or the internship is fully in line with the, the strategic interest of the university. Uh, how to sharpen your or, or to increase your chances? Um, frankly, the selection process that we have is very similar to what you would find anywhere else, meaning that we will ask the university to send us CVs, we will run interviews, and we will give our top candidates back to the university, and the university will decide in the end because they are, uh, first of all, they, they, they are the affiliation organization of the, of the student, but also in most cases, also the funding agency. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. Um, I think uh, we'll only be able to take one um, final question. I don't know, there's a lot of questions here, but <laughs> we have two minutes to join. There's a lot of brilliant questions here. I mean, no, uh, but I think I'm just going to um, take this one. We have just a minute. Oh my God. Um, so this person said, what is SEND's most significant um, achievement so far and how do they manage the vast amount of data generated by the LHC? Uh, I mean, so far, the discovery of the Higgs boson is the absolute best we did, right? I mean, the, the LHC program was launched in the late 90s. It had cost about a billion, $1.5 billion dollars. And finding, and it was really meant to find something, to get a Nobel Prize. And, and the prime candidate that we were hoping to, to discover was the Higgs boson. So for us, for the CERN staff, for the CERN community, finding the Higgs boson was something that made us extremely proud and was a very significant milestone uh, for the lab and for the community of high energy physics. Fantastic. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so I think um, the link to the virtual tour is um, going to be active now. Um, so, yep. Um, so join the virtual tour. I don't know, there's so much question here. There is so much. This is so beautiful to see. <laughs> this is so good to see. Um, I think we even have some universities joining from Ghana, from Kenya. This is so beautiful. Uh, but I'm so sorry, guys, but we won't be able to take all these questions. Um, it's time to join CERN um, for the virtual um, visit. If, I don't know, I'm going to try to discuss this with uh, Mr. Martin, if it is possible for us to be able to have a session with him again, so you guys can have ask this. I mean, these are beautiful questions. So, uh, well, who knows? I'll probably get back to you guys on that. Um, but the link to joining um, CERN's virtual visit um, is in the chat section now so please go there um it's um in your emails too so you can go to this chat section you see there click on it i think it should be live now um let's um join say let's just join into geneva <laughs> so this should be beautiful thank you so much mr martin thank you, very much. Thank you. bye bye enjoy the visit yes sir thank you sir thanks Um, okay, um, just to explain how it's done. So if you click on that link, you're going to be redirected to a page. Um, and on that page, uh, you're going to be, um, how do you say this? So for those that ask um, questions, see, I'm going to take um, your questions. I'm going to forward them to Mr. Martin and hopefully you'll get an answer to that or we'll see if we can put uh, a subsequent session together. Something, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, if you click on this link, you'll be re redirected to a page. On that page, you're going to see um, um what are you going to see that i'm coming uh you're going to see overview you're going to see cms guides you're going to see connection um so you should click on connection when you click on connection you see the um detail to the zoom um 
um, the Zoom link and all of that. So click on it and you should be able to join us um, immediately. If you're joining uh, with a university, um, please try as much as possible to join with the name of the university, right? So, uh, the When you join Zoom, Zoom is going to ask you to give it a name. So give it the name of the your university, not your own name. Um, so yeah, I'll see you uh, in Geneva. <laughs> so yeah, let's go there now. 